At Medical Service Company, we understand that time and convenience are precious. That's why we've introduced a range of virtual service options, allowing our patients to experience unparalleled support at their fingertips. Located on our website, MSC Chat is our online chat solution that assists with updating accounts, changing insurance details, and submitting physician contact information. Patients can also access frequently asked questions and basic troubleshooting information instantly from the comfort of their home. And for our valued sleep therapy patients, the MSC Sleep CPAP community is a private Facebook group, providing existing patients with a collaborative community for ongoing support and encouragement. Within this group, patients can ask and answer questions, learn valuable tips and tricks, and participate in engaging discussions related to their therapy. In addition, they can connect with other PAP users and join our live events to hear directly from our knowledgeable MSC respiratory therapist. With our virtual support services, patients can access the support they need at a time that suits them best. Connect with us at our website at www.medicalserviceco.com or on social media to start experiencing the future of medical support. For our next lecture in our Sleep and Respiratory series, Medical Service Company would like to welcome Dr. Jennifer Riggs. Dr. Riggs earned her associate's degree in respiratory care and a bachelor's degree in healthcare system administration from Ferris State University and continued on to receive her master's in education with instructor focus. She later earned her PhD in educational leadership from Western Michigan University. Dr. Riggs is currently lead professor of respiratory care at Muskegon Community College and adjunct instructor of general health at Grand Rapids Community College. She's an active member of the AARC, ASCD, MSRC, and is an American Heart Association instructor. We are excited to have Dr. Riggs as a first-time speaker for our forum and hope you enjoy her presentation today. If you have any questions, please submit them using the Engage tab, and please be sure to complete the evaluation at the conclusion of the lecture. Enjoy! So hot topics in the management of COPD and obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the only disclosure I have is that I am a contracted consultant for Air, Air Life um, Home Care Company. Or, the objectives today is to understand the updated gold standards for COPD patients, describe the treatment plan for a patient with stable COPD and for patients with acute exacerbation of COPD, Describe the effects of COPD on our OSA patients, patient population. The gold 2023 updates, um, their annual focus update was to change the definition, diagnosis, and management of COPD. Gold's mission is to increase awareness of COPD, improve diagnosis, diagnosis, management, and prevention, decrease morbidity and mortality, and to stimulate research. These um, updates are done annually, and the ones that focus this year that we're gonna talk about is the definition, diagnosis, and management of our COPD patients for acute and exacerbation COPD. Why do we care? The cost of COPD management um, in 2020 was $49 billion, which was an increase from 2010, where it was $32 billion. 51% um, of that cost is for our Medicare patients, 25% is for our Medicaid patients, and 18% is private insurance. It's roughly 10% of adults in the U.S., 40 and older, that have COPD. In 2019, it was the third leading cause of death globally in the U.S. and in the world, with about 3 billion million people um, affected with COPD, and we're seeing an increase in the numbers with that. COPD is a heterogeneous disease process, so the new definition does Make sure we uh, understand the lung conditions are characterized by chronic respiratory symptoms, 
dyspnea cough, sputum production, exacerbations. It's due to abnormalities of the airways from bronchitis and bronchiolitis and the alveolar and emphysema effects. This disease that causes a persistent, often progressive airflow obstruction. It's heterogeneous because it has many faces. Emphysema has rapid declines and it has frequent exacerbations. Patients can come in with small airways, can have mixed um, emphysema and fibrosis. It could be smokers and non-smokers. It could be asthmatics. There's a large overlay for these patients. Airflow limitation that is not fully reversible is how we end up diagnosing our COPD patients based off spirometry. Um, that persistent inflammation that the patients are reporting have airway thickening, they have alveolar destruction and excessive mus mucus production. And that excessive mucus production leads to mechanical and physiological changes of the airways, which decreases that airflow and we're not able to fully reverse it. FEV1 and FVC are the pulmonary functions that we use to diagnose um, our COPD patients. Gold uses um, four stages to diagnose it off the FEV1, stages one through four, mild, moderate, severe, to very severe, being mild greater than 80 to severe where there's less than 30 percent. Early detection for COPD is a huge indicator where we can sage our patients and help them avoid hospitalizations and exacerbations later on down the road. So COPD is diagnosed um, in the following when we, when we do diagnose that we're finding 50 percent of our patients are coming in with stage two already. Um, stage one is 19%, stage three is 26%, but stage four is 50%. So most of our patients, when they're diagnosed with their FEV1s, are going to be diagnosed at already stage two. One out of five are diagnosed during hospital exacerbations, and only two of the five will have a pulmonary function to confirm spirometry. Reasons why we're underdiagnosing is because we're, it's not common recognized. There's inadequate smoking histories. Um, there's an age bias against COPD in younger patients. There's a gender bias against women in COPD. And patients are denying or will not discuss COPD or symptoms with, with their physicians. Spirometry is also missing in the primary care physician's offices. So without knowing these patients are coming in the COPD, we're missing a lot of them early on in that stage one where we can do the most healing for them. The gold standard COPD updated its definition, um, the basic definition and the exacerbation definition. The definition of COPD focuses more on the diverse nature of COPD and states that the heterogeneous lung condition characterized by chronic respiratory <clears throat> symptoms due to abnormalities of the airways and alveoli that cause persistent and progressive airflow obstructions. They removed causative agents from the definition because it is not just caused by one or two many things. With exacerbations, we've looked at changing the definition to remove the verbiage of exacerbations that require additional therapy. Acute exacerbations, the definition of exacerbation was updated to be more inclusive regarding the signs and symptoms. Those signs and symptoms that they're looking to include are include dyspnea, cough, sputum production, with a time frame reference for symptoms of less than 14 days. So actually looking to see if it's an exacerbation or a disease process getting worse on these patients.
The assessment tool is a stepwise approach to decide the degree of assessment for patients with them. And this um, assesses the degree of airflow obstruction. It assesses the symptoms based off the modified medical research council dyspnea assessment and the the CAT score, the COPD assessment tool. We're looking at exacerbations, <clears throat> and then we're going to rate them in the how are they based off their PF pulmonary function for their FEV1, whether it's the gold one, two, three, or four, how many exacerbations they've had within the last year, and then we can place them into the A, B, or E assessment tool to help us guide their care for those patients. And that's based off the symptoms that the patients are reporting. Additionally, the pharmacological changes have been changed where we are doing the LAVAs and LAMAs as the preferred treatment for initial therapies for our patients in group B and A. Um, <clears throat> the LAVA being the long-acting beta agonist and the LAMA being that long-acting muscarinic agent. Um, therapy, instead of either one of them alone, we're doing them as a combined medications. We will go into triple therapy medications if our patients are having eosinophils, um, blood eosinophils greater than 300 cells or greater, or have a consistent asthma exacerbation episodes with it. If they have more than two exacerbations in a year, um, if the patient falls in group B and their blood eosinophils are between 100 and 300, that patient is considered um might benefit from an ICS being added to it, those their benefits. Um, ICS is used um, only if they have multiple, um, is, ICSs are not straight use anymore for these patients. Patients with exacerbation, we are now recommending the triple therapy um, with exacerbation, the bronchodilators, no more monotherapy is allowed, are recommended. They prefer the lava llamas and the ICSs together, the combos, when they're in exacerbation. Based on this pathway, the gold recommends is escalation to a triple therapy if the patient is ex experiencing exacerbations. With different preferences in their eosinophils, the patients being treated with dual bronchodilators or the patients being treated with a monotherapy. The dyspnea pathway is to be used if a patient has a dyspnea episode that is treatable um, to target with the exacerbations. So we follow the pathways if it's a dyspnea versus an exacerbation on how we're going to treat those patients with them. Triple therapy for the exacerbations. For the dyspneas, we're still doing this, the llamas and the llamas. <laughs> um, the gold updates, gold in 2023 has removed the recommended ICSs and LABAs initial follow-up with treatment algorithms. It's no longer recommended for it to be an ICS and a LABA. Um, they only are adding the ICSs, like I said, if they're having not having, they're having more than two exacerbations in a year. If the patient is developing further exacerbations, then we consider the ICSs with those patients. And then, Patients are to be treated with the LABAs and the LAMAs instead of a SABAs for rescues. They want them to be maintained and controlled before we start going into um, other treatment methods for these patients.
Considering the initiation of ICSs, these are the strong favored uses that the patient has had more than two hospitalizations um, with COPD in a year, um, had blood intervals greater than 300, and a history of our containment asthma. They're favoring the use if a patient has had moderate exacerbations in the COPD, so one exacerbation that's ended up hospitalized. And we're against, um, the gold is against ICFs if they have had repeat pneumonia events, um, blood cinephils less than 100, and a history of mycobacterial infections. ICFs in that category is, um, actually leads to an increased mortality for those patients. COPD um, classification and ex, um, exacerbation severity is going to be um, based off of a couple different factors on these patients, and we're going to put this on the scale. It's been proposed. It's easy to obtain these clinical variables from the professionals. They're looking at the severity of the exacerbation from mild, moderate to severe. They're classifying those on clinical measurements of the patient's dyspnea scale, heart rate, respiratory rate, resting saturation, and ABGs for moderate to severe um, classifications. It's therefore important to expand the taxonomy classifications of COPD to include non-smoking related COPD types. So specific studies have been designed to conduct for th um, different types of COPD etiotypes, looking at patients who are COPG, which is our um, alpha-1 and a trypsin disorder, our COPD-D, which is early life events, including premature birth or low birth weight babies, um, COPD-C is cigarette smoking um, exposure. COPD-I is childhood infections, tuberculosis, or HIV compromised patients. Um, and so we're expanding how we're looking at our COPD patients to make sure we're looking at them. And we're looking at the ratio of inspired as their spirometries also to see the changes in those. Gold also updated there's um, <clears throat> other non pharmacological cares for our patients. Um, the importance of non-pharmacological in interventions has reduced the mortality. It's emphasized this update includes smoking sensations, whether it be medications, um, to counseling services, or however the patient feels that they can do the smoking sensation. Vaccinations, including the pneumonia vaccine early on, patients involved in pulmonary rehab and engaging in pulmonary education long-term oxygen therapy, and then preventative care, along with self-management education, um, <clears throat> palliative care if needed, interventional and surgical, surgical options if it comes down to that with those patients also. The goal for CO treatment of the goal for treatment of stable COPD is to reduce the symptoms and prevent exacerbations. Once the COPD diagnosis is established, effective management should be based on an individual assessment to reduce both current symptoms and future exacerbations. Management strategies are um, not limited to the pharmacological treatment and should be complement. Um, completed by the non along with the non pharmacological 
interventions. So to reduce symptoms, we're looking to increase exercise tolerance. It's helping with pulmonary rehab, encouraging the patients to take small walks, improving their health status, including their comorbidities that may be out there with them, reduce irritant exposure in their smoking sensation classes. To prevent exacerbations, we're trying to prevent disease progression, to prevent those lungs from deteriorating into a further exacerbation prevent and mitigate exacerbations, and then reduce morbidity and mortality from these patients. The individual treatment approach for COPD, um, the pharmacological treatment for COPD should be individualized for each patient. Not all the patients are gonna be treated the same, Therapies need to be guided for severity of the symptoms and risks of exacerbations, for the side effects of the comorbidities, for the medications that are available and the cost of those medications, the patient's response, preference, and the ability to use drugs delivery devices. Um, unfortunately, some of our medications, inhalers, DPIs, will need um, some more education for those patients with it. So depending on how those patients are able to use those devices and whether they fall into which category they need for treatment. The non-pharmacological treatment for those patients is using the pulmonary rehab, maximize personal functions to keep their love, um, a daily activities of daily living at this stage that they should be. And then integrating care and making it a full whole person health literacy, making sure the patient is aware of everybody who's there to help them with the process. Additional patients with or patients with COPD should have an assessment of the severity of their airflow obstruction, um, symptoms and history, exacerbations, exposure to risk factors, and comorbidities and guided management. When we diagnose the patients, we're basing a diagnosis off their symptoms, their risk factors, and spirometry. Ideally, getting repeat spirometries every year if needed. Then we do the initial assessment and place them between their gold standards of one through four and then their gold ABD or ABE. Um, work with them on their smoking status test to make sure they're not an alpha-1 antitrypsin patient. See if there's any other comorbidities that we need to address while we're talking to them for their care. And then the initial management phase is doing smoking sensations, encouraging the vaccines, keeping a patient active and engaged in their lifestyle choices, whether it's exercise program, walking, those type of things, setting up their initial therapies and the lavas and llamas, doing the self-management um, and managing their comorbidities. Then we will review those with those patients following their symptoms, exacerbations, smoking status, exposure and risk factors, Inhaler technique and adherence, um, self-management skills, how they're managing their breathlessness, are they following the COPD action plan, um, do they need to have oxygen, do they need to have um, non-invasive ventilation um, type of things, and we're going to adjust therapy. And so it's a continuum of cycles of care for these patients, making sure that we're going around and always evaluating them so they're not progressing into a later stage or later goal therapy for them. Treatment of uh, stable CPD, um, group A, all group A patients should be offered a short or long-acting bronchodilator treatment based on its effectiveness for their breathlessness. 
Um, so group A, you'll see some of them just have a saba. A lot of them are going to have a lava because they're trying to steer the patients more towards the maintenance and controller medications versus the rescue medications. Group B is going to be a lava and a llama. That's their initial pharmacological choice, um, <clears throat> especially if the patients had less than one exacerbations in the year before this, um, they will be treated with those. Group E is preferred choice as initial therapy is also a lava and a llama, but we're checking the cinephils. And if they're over the 300, then we will do the triple therapy of the lava, llama, and ICS. Um, that has been shown to be superior than just a lava and an ICS. So adding the triple therapy has been the, is the considered the gold standard um, for that those patient populations. And in group E, those patients have had two or more um, exacerbations and have been at least hospitalized at least once for their COPD and their disease process. Treating our stable patients, it's a continuum cycle also. So we review their symptoms, looking at their dyspnea scale um, and their exacerbation risks. Are they getting themselves exposed? Are they doing more activities? Are they around more triggers for their patients? We're looking at what they have for access, um, their inhaler technique, adherence to their inhaler technique, is there anything non-pharmacological that we need to have? Would they be benefit from pulmonary rehab? Would they be benefit from some more education? Um, and then we're going to adjust it. And we'll escalate the patient if we need to, to a different state, uh, level, if depending on how they're following up with their symptoms and their dyspnea scale. So they can escalate higher on the gold standard, so they can escalate lower, depending on how the patient is treated with those. We do switch inhalers and devices um, in the same classifications that the patients are not tolerating them. So making sure that they're understanding the need and how to take those inhalers and to adjust them appropriately. If it's an exacerbation type treatment, um, Golden tends to use the exacerbation pathway for patients with exacerbations that have a treatable trait to target or to both dys the dyspnea and the exacerbations of the current maintenance medications. Based on the pathway, Gold recommends escalation to triple therapy if the patient's experiencing exacerbations. Um, Based on those patients, the cinephils also they will see if they need them, uh, the triple therapy. The dyspnea pathway, so the pathway on the left there, um, is to be used if the patient has a dyspnea that is treatable trait that can be targeted without an exacerbation. Um, so looking at those signs and symptoms on how the patient is going to respond initially to that therapy and what's going to help maintain that initial therapy. The initial treatment within the infographic ledger here um, refers to where healthcare practitioners should begin patients' assessments to determine their initial ph pharmacological treatment. Um, we clinicians should classify treatments um, as for the patients as either group A, B, or E and prescribe the appropriate treatments as indicated in this algorithm. It just kind of lays it out nicely. Um, patients are already receiving treatment should begin at the most appropriate step in the algorithm. Gold states that the acinophil levels as recommended are estimated, are not precise cutoffs. 
So looking at the patient as a whole, as a holistic evaluation of their exacerbation risk should also be considered in when we're going to start escalating or de-escalating therapy on those patients. This chart here shows you the non-pharmacological management of COPD that could be included, um, physical activity, vaccination, education, nutritional support. Many of our COPD patients don't understand the nutritional needs um, to breathe, and so this is a good option for them. Also, their interventional therapy, palliative care if needed, um, ventilatory support, oxygen therapy, physical activity type of it. As we're progressing down the diagram of treatments, um, obviously the management of diagnosis, this is the hierarchy of it. As we progress down, we've increased the severity of the disease and the mor morbidity and mortality of that patient. Trying to reduce the risk factors as much as possible, whether it's um, cigarette smoking, exposure to different toxins, changing that in, when we add on pulmonary rehab, the more of these treatment plans we add on, the more severe that COPD is getting, more odds are their COPD stage has changed from gold one, two, or three to the four to from to more severe for those patients. The goal of COPD management is to reduce the exacerbation risks. Exacerbations comprise a majority of our disease burden and the cost in our healthcare systems. Um, the every time a patient has an exacerbation, um, they have increased their impairment of their lung functions. Um, they have negative impact on their quality of life. They usually accelerated their lung function decline and have increased their mortality. Um, exacerbations are classified as a mild, moderate, or severe. Mild means they are clinical symptoms. Um, they're using more of their rescue medications at home, and there's usually not a change in their medications for needed. A moderate one, there's clinical symptoms. There's usually an escalation in the, in the medication, so they need to have some antimicrobials or steroids introduced. Um, and then severe is when they're in the emergency rooms or hospitalized for those for the exacerbations. Trying to manage them out. When we start looking at COPD and obstructive sleep apnea, COPD is closely related to cigarette smoking and airway contagion uh, issues, but a great number of our patients have both COPD and obstructive sleep apnea. Um, OSA is closely related to obesity and snoring. Both experience between COPD and OSA are going to experience a reduction in energy activity which further contributes to a majority of these patients have the eucapnic during wakefulness. Um, about 11% of our sleep apneic patients are gonna have some degree of COPD, whether it's labeled at one, two, three, or four, but 20 to 40% of our COPD patients do have OSA. Um, a lot of them are gonna complain of day daytime hypercapnia, um, they're having a higher breath frequency, um, they're increased nocturnal desaturations, increased risk of hypercapnia, pulmonary hypertension, and polycythemia. They also have an increased risk for cardiac morbidity and mortality with the combination of them together. The treatment plan for our COPD OSA patients is um, if it's a weight loss journey, um, 
they will do encourage weight loss. Oxygen therapy from low flow to high flow nasal cannula with high levels of humidity could be beneficial for the patients. Um, <clears throat> oxygen therapy is the common treatment. Um, it's shown to improve overall mortality if it's used for more than 18 hours a day, um, including during sleep. Nocturnal oxygen, um, <clears throat> excuse me. CPAP therapy remains the accepted standard for treatment for our sleep apnea patients um, and patients with our COPD. They usually need higher humidifications to help mobilize those secretions. Um, CPAP alone may not be fully correct the hypoxemia, so we may need to add supplemental oxygen on top of that. By using CPAP, there could be potential to unload um, the respiratory muscles, which decreases that hypoventilation and oxygen consumptions. So those muscles are um, maybe rested um, when you're using CPAP and prevent airway resistance during sleep. Bi-level ventilation could be used, um, volume present ventilation, so some type of non-invasive ventilation is what we're looking at for these patients. Um, a subset of COPD patients, stable COPD patients, will benefit from non-invasive ventilation. Um, those day with daytime hypercapnias, and the, making sure we're maintaining a positive pressure support between IPAP and EPAP when we're maintaining that alveolar ventilation to reduce that PaCO2. Other considerations that we need to be aware of for our CP. COPD OSA patients is to reduce alcohol consumption. It worsens hypoxemia, leading to hypercapnia and respiratory failure. Encourage the smoking sensations because dangerous with that um, smoking sensations are there. We need to make sure the, the patients are adherent to their protocols for CPAP. Um, the, there's four A's of adherence, acceptance, which means breaking down those physiological barriers of diagnosis and treatment, acquiring, maintaining and getting the device and the mass needed, acclimating to the therapy and adapting um, long-term. Acceptance must occur before adherence can be achieved Perceive, um, for the perceived need for the CPAP. It's not uncommon for patients to doubt their severity of OSA. Um, the first night effect concerns about side effects. There's been research that has shown that educated patients are more compliant and spousal's, um, important, spousal's feelings are important also. Education should encompass the discussion of comorbidities, long-term health consequences, provide encouragements, and involve the family. To acclimate to the CPAP device, there's a number of studies that report that the first two weeks of CPAP initiation is the most important two weeks. Um, that correlates to what the 30-day usage studies have reported that 84% of patients who use their CPAP for more than four hours a day <clears throat> have CPAP for more than average, will, will continue to use it for the 30 days. Adapting patients experience, um, we got to have patients also adapt to it. Patients experience a difference and unique to them. There's some psychological and social factors. There's risk perception to the disease, treatment outcomes, self-efficacy, coping mechanisms, and factors that are going to affect those barriers. So for our patients to engage and accept that adherence to those CPAP devices, they really need to be able to acclimate to it, to feel comfortable with it and have compliance with it. It is a benefit to them if they're going to use it, making sure the patients are aware of that.
So in summary, the initial assessment tool has been modified by the gold standards from ABCD to ABDE to recognize the clinical relevance of exacerbations and level of symptoms. The LAVAs and LAMAs is recommended as preferred initial therapy for groups B and E. In group A, we'll have a some type of bronchodilator, um, just depending if it's a LAVA or a SABA. Triple therapy can be considered as well as initial therapy for patients um, in group E when they have blood eosinophils greater than 300. Triple therapy is recommended as a follow-up treatment in both patients with exacerbation on bronchodilators as a model therapy. COPD and OSA will coexist together. Both are very common together. CPAP is the gold standard for our OSA patients. And then oxygen is needed to reduce that hypoxemia. And it's also commonly used in our PAP devices. We encourage heated humidifiers for optimal levels to enhance adherence to the CPAP. And it's also for our COPD patients to help mobilize secretions and reduce, reduce the risk of exacerbations. Hello, Leo Nizzi again with Medical Service Company. Uh, thank you, Dr. Riggs, for joining us. Another extremely relevant and important topic. Uh, I know the, the issue with frequent flyer COPD patients in hospitals seems to be never ending. So uh, definitely a topic that was close to our heart in the durable medical equipment industry, and I'm sure a lot of the people watching. So thank you for speaking on it. Uh, we do have a few questions that came over for you. So we'll jump right in so we have enough time. Sound good? Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, so first question for you is, at what COPD stage do patients become more susceptible to respiratory failure? Um, we're tending to see it later on in the stages, like late stage two, like old stage two, three. Most of our patients aren't getting diagnosed until they're in stage two already. And so then they've already are compromising their lungs. And so from the research that's been out there right now, it's that late stage two, early stage three. Wonderful. And just a, a follow-up out of curiosity, do you tend to see that respiratory failure being more diagnosed in the outpatient setting, or is it really one of those exacerbations that ends up in the hospital where, it, where it's getting identified? Yep, typically it's in the hospital, the exacerbations is what's bringing them in. All right, wonderful. Uh, next question, you mentioned that many patients aren't diagnosed until they are at gold stage two. How can we work to identify COPD gold stage one patients sooner in the disease state? A lot of it is, is clinical assessment um, at when you're in the homes, um, seeing those patients, looking at their lifestyle choices. Do they smoke, vapes, all of those different cigarette um, options that are out there for patients? We're seeing the sooner we can get the education out to them, be aware of it, um, we're able to find them and hopefully encourage them to quit and maintain that a little sooner um, with it. So a lot of it's based off the clinicians, um, the therapists, um, the patient, people who are in the homes, the nurses, that faculty or anybody who's seeing those patients early on and is able to encourage that behavior and lifestyle choices. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense. And I, I love the fact that you mentioned the the vaping, if you will, because, you know, we're so used to COPD patients being that hardcore question of if you ever were a cigarette smoker, right? Yeah. And, uh, now everybody says no, but there's there's different options for that. Yeah. And we're starting to see a lot of um, COPD patients getting diagnosed younger because of the vaping. Um, so that is a huge increase in our numbers, unfortunately, because um, it's more of the um, younger generation that's doing the vaping. Sure. No, I appreciate you elaborating on that. So uh, next question for you, and I know this is always a difficult one and it goes back and forth in the industries, is can you talk a little bit about the contradictions of using auto CPAP with COPD patients? Um, unfortunately, we're trying to maintain that alveolar ventilation. And so with the auto CPAP, we are going to miss um, some of those triggers from that, the, from keeping their pressure support and keeping those lungs and the alveoli opened. And so I know um, some patients really do well with that. And from what I 
from what I've read in the studies of it, it's the early stages of COPD that they'll do fine in it, but those late deteriorating stages, those patients are going to struggle and it's going to put them in more of a hypercapnic episode. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, of course. Next question for you is what do you think can be done from the physician's office perspective to help further educate COPD patients within the limited appointment time frame that we have? Oh, that's the hard part. Um, getting a COPD navigator or educator in there, um, unfortunately, patient education, it takes time. Um, it's initially a first consult with these patients, just having a conversation with them, getting them engaged could be a 20 minute conversation. Um, you really have to build that rapport with the patients. And so I see that's where the difficulty is because the time is limited. Um, but being um, servicing them more than one time, you're building that rapport. And so hopefully by keep going back to them for whatever they need, um, we're able to get those re relationships built and to build that relationship there with them. Yeah. And that definitely shed some light on your early comment about getting patients to be kind of upfront and honest with their COPD symptoms and, and their history and all those kinds of things. So it's start, we're starting to paint the picture here of how to identify some of these patients and get into the root cause of the issues. Um, so next question for you that popped in was for patients that have both COPD and OSA, how can we work to optimize care for these patients when both conditions are being handled by separate providers? <laughs> Get the providers to communicate with each other would be a great tool for that. Um, you have to manage the COPD symptoms plus with the obesity patients. So you're trying to make sure you're managing both. Ideally, if they could see the same provider, they could have a good completion of care. Um, full circle of that would be the best benefit for it. Um, but making sure you're looking at um, which one's going to be the worst de detriment to the patient, making the COPD worse. Um, so we have to make sure we're trying to work together with those physicians. Um, and that sometimes is the, the turf war that we come in balance with. Sure. And actually, it brings up a follow-up question that I was thinking of during your conversation is that if you are seeing one clinician and you're, you're diagnosed with COPD and OSA in the same time frame, you know, maybe even in the same appointment type of situation, what should we do to treat, what should we treat first? Should we treat something first or should we be treating both diagnoses simultaneously with each other? Whichever one's causing the, more, the exacerbation of the patient um, would be the one. You want to treat the symptoms of the patient, the shortness of breath, the dyspnea, while still recognizing the underlying cause of it. So you need to treat both, but we need to get the patient to a level of care where they can treat both at the same time. Um, so Ideally, the pulmonologist would hopefully be able to work on both of them at the same time, but making sure they're getting that dyspnea scale covered, the exertions, exacerbations under control. The patient's not going to be compliant if they can't breathe. They're not going to be compliant and wear their CPAP if they're struggling to breathe. So we need to make sure both are working hand in hand, but whatever is causing the most detriment to the patient's lungs at that time would be what you should address. Sure. And I can definitely recommend you work closely with your DME provider because when we get to those insurance guidelines for those patients that have both, right, it becomes a little bit tricky depending on what you maybe diagnose first or document first. So exactly. it's uh, a tight definitely a good thing to keep an eye on. Uh, next question, just as we kind of move along in the disease state here, uh, is NIV or non-invasive ventilation being underutilized in this overlapping population? Uh, is BiPAP plus oxygen seems to be the go-to therapy? but NIV does not require a sleep study and is proven to be more effective. Is that correct? I think it is underutilized um, because it is, you do see the benefit of that. But I think um, for some reasons they are, we'll do the BiPAP and the O2 therapy. Anytime we put a COPD patient on O2 therapy, it's just another step in their disease process that's going to be more detrimental to them. So ideally if we could keep them off the oxygen therapy as much as possible, whether it be in the NIV, um, it would be great for us to do that with them. But I do see that also that they're using more BiPAP and O2 versus the NIV. Um, and some of the physicians I've talked to said it's it's easier to get it than it is the NIV. So I don't know if that's on the back end of insurance issues um, with it, but that's kind of what they're saying. This is the easier route. Sure, makes sense. And obviously we saw a huge change with Medicare guidelines for oxygen qualifications, which is going back and forth between clinicians in the industry, you know, just opening up the possibility to put more patients on oxygen, but not necessarily it being the, the correct answer for them. So I can't wait to hear more about that in the, in the future. Uh, last question for you in the interest of time, uh, in your opinion, and this goes back to, you know, the opening up of the oxygen population or the qualification for oxygen, uh, in your opinion, what are the best treatments for early stage COPD to avoid hospital admissions due to exacerbations? 
getting them into a pulmonary rehab program. Um, I, the true benefit, get them on a COPD pathway. They're starting to do um, action plans now for COPDers. And so if you can start getting those onto patients early on, the education component of it, that's the best thing we can do for these patients. Encourage them to do the small activities, the small walks, those type of things, distracting instead of smoking, chew on ice cubes, pick some different topic that's gonna be helpful for them. Getting them to actively engage in their care is gonna be the best benefit for them early on. Yeah, makes sense. I can tell you my grandfather gave up smoking cigarettes in exchange for uh, eating dumb, dumb lollipops. So it works. Uh, there's, definitely, there's definitely ways out there to make it work. Um, but thank you, Dr. Riggs, Riggs. We know that this is a very important topic. You know, hospitals continue to have issues with frequent flyers and COPD patients. And I know uh, we, especially all the clinicians in the area that we work with, are really trying to identify those patients early on before they just, you know, have a hospital bed with their name on it, if you will. So uh, thank you for shedding light on a very important topic. Thank you for your time. And thank you so much for the care of your patients. All right. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Have a great day. You too.